slide. So I'm going to make a case for why hospitals are being hurt by the current system and we'd be better with single payer. Under the current system, we've had a massive increase of managers overseeing um, a much smaller rise in physicians. Uh, so managers shown here accelerating in the early 90s, uh, far and away outstripping the increase that we see in the number of physicians at the bottom. And this is specifically healthcare managers. So never have so many managers managed such a unchanged number of physicians. Um, in the United States, we have a ridiculous overhead compared to the other uh, capitalist uh, rich democracies around the world um, in our insurance overhead per capita. We pay a lot more uh, just for the insurance overhead than they do to manage the insurance system. Hospital billing and administration costs in the United States are five times that of Canada. Not surprising given all of the hoops uh, that uh, folks like Larry and his colleagues have to jump through um, and then jump through again and then jump through again. Duke Medical Center, uh, just by way of example, because that was the published article, um, has across three hospitals, they have 957 beds and 1,600 billing clerks for those 957 beds. That is insane. By comparison, University of Toronto Academic Medical Center, just a single hospital with 456 beds, has three billing clerks. Basically one for Ontario, one for the rest of Canada, and one for the rest of the world. We heard uh, earlier about um, all this crazy contracted rate schedules. As bad as Larry has it, uh, Cleveland Clinic, because they draw on uh, the entire country as a referral base, has um, 3,000 different contracted rate schedules that they have to deal with. And of course, with all of the wide range of conditions they take care of, 70,000 different lines. So they basically have 210 million uh, different data points that each and every biller has to deal with. Yay. Um, so other countries do a far better job than we do. And I just want to point out, again, we're talking only the developed capitalist democracies here. It's, they do it without any sense of rationing. We have rationing by ability to pay. They don't. So if you look here, hospital days per person per year is actually higher in these other countries. So they have universal uh, uh, not-for-profit uh, coverage. Uh, they have a diversity of hospitals and they provide more hospital care than we do, not less. Uh, if you look here, we see the total number of hospital beds per thousand population. And again, the United States is at the lower end uh, compared to most of the rest of uh, the developed capitalist countries. Again, they have more hospitals than we do, more hospital beds than we do. They have a slightly different employment in those hospitals. If you look at the United States, we have a somewhat higher total hospital employment per thousand population. Um, of those, however, a smaller number are actual healthcare staff and a much larger number he, shown here are administrative and other hospital staff. So in the United States, although it's 21 uh, hospital uh, employees per thousand population, only 11.2 of those are actual healthcare staff and 9.9 .9 of them are administrative uh, staff. So again, never have so many administrators administrated, so relatively few healthcare providers. Um, so the industry lobbyists, uh, and nationally this includes the for-profit hospitals, uh, the ones that are purely Wall Street owned, um, if you will, um, one of their claims is, oh, as Larry suggested, because privates pay more than Medicare, if it's only Medicare, then the revenues will be less and the hospitals will close. I'd like to debunk that argument in the following way. First of all, the case mix is false. Uh, it's not an average of private plus Medicare. Uh, a real case mix is private plus Medicare plus Medicaid plus the underinsured plus the uninsured charity care and no pay. And the hospitals that are doing extra well now just happen to be those that are not taking their fair share of the others. And that those that are taking care of them already, those are the ones that are financially stressed. The Medicare reimbursement rate argument is false. Uh, the claim is based on a lower standard Medicare rate as if there's only one rate. But of course, even now there is not a single rate. Hospitals that need more, such as teaching hospitals with residency programs and small rural hospitals 
known as critical access hospitals, already get higher rates. And that would, of course, continue. Furthermore, uh, just uh, a month ago, the uh, 2021 MedPAC report to Congress stated hospital marginal profits on Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries was about 8%. So I'm um, not exactly sure why that would be making them go bankrupt. Uh, also would point out that Maryland, which still has all payer, which New York had until it got rid of, I think, in the Pataki administration, um, uh, pays all their hospitals uh, the same uh, rates by uh, statewide law. Private pays the same as Medicare. And yet somehow or other, though, the Maryland hospitals are doing just fine. Uh, you know, you don't hear anything about Johns Hopkins closing. Um, again, the rest of the developed capitalist democracies manage to have open hospitals that stay open are more stable, less financially stressed than the US. It is also simply a false assumption that Medicare for all means Medicare as it is reimbursement rates. Uh, the actual legislation calls for rates that are determined by a process similar to current Medicare, but not necessarily the actual rates being the same. And there are some analyses that have been done suggesting that the rates would be roughly at 110% of current Medicare. Um, unlike now, where it's all behind the scenes with private Wall Street uh, investors running the show, i.e. the private insurance companies talking to the private hospitals um, and behind closed doors, all of this process would be transparent and accountable. And you know, in a sense, that's what democracy is supposed to be, political uh, transparency and political accountability. If, in fact, it's everybody in and nobody out, then the funding has to be sufficient to keep the hospitals open because it's the rich and powerful people that are going to those same hospitals. And finally, I would suggest that um, there's also the issue of administrative costs coming down. Um, the um, Sorry, this seems to be running off the slide a little bit. I just want to point out that the administrative costs would be coming down here because, uh, first of all, they get some of the same savings that everyone else does with Medicare for all in terms of uh, not only the reduced billing administration costs, as we saw in Larry's description, and also those crazy overheads at Duke and uh, that five to one uh, ratio that we saw with uh, Canada, uh, but their drug and equipment costs come down because again, we're negotiating with monospony power to reduce the drug and equipment costs come down and that helps save hospitals money. Hospitals also benefit simply because they're employers. And as employers, they're currently paying too much for their employees' health coverage. And so like other employers that are contributing to the current system, they would save money. And the estimates here range from at least 10% to 25% savings for the hospitals. Um, so that's one argument, um, and I just want to dispense with it. Now, there's another argument that, in fact, there ought to be less hospitals, that all of these hospital closures and reduction in the hospital beds um, is a good thing, because nowadays we have shorter lengths of stay. We have modern medicine that's changed since you know the 1960s or 70s. We have shorter lengths of stay. More procedures are done on a completely outpatient basis, and so we don't need as many hospitals or beds. And while that may be true, or maybe not, that's a different discussion. Uh, what is true is that has nothing to do with where the closures are occurring. The closures are not occurring across the board. They're not occurring on the basis of community need, but rather on the basis of Wall Street greed. So the real question isn't, do we need less hospitals and hospital beds, which was the superficial approach that Berger Commission and others took, uh, took and uh, tried to claim. It's which hospitals and where are the closures actually occurring? And they are, of course, occurring disproportionately in poorer rural areas and poorer urban areas. And research in urban areas shows that the strongest predictor of closure is, guess what, higher percentage of black and brown people being cared for. Meanwhile, those high-tech, uh, urgy care centers and surgery care, uh, surgical uh, outpatient surgery sites um, are disproportionately showing up in the wealthier urban and suburban areas. Um, box on the left here shows nationwide hospital closures according to the MedPAC report. Interestingly enough, uh, the AHA, American Hospital Association report, has higher numbers than this one using slightly different definitions. Uh, there's been a fair amount in the news about the rural hospital closures since 2005. 180 uh, hosp uh, rural hospitals have closed. There was a GAO uh, report that showed that the average, tra average travel distance in 
rural areas where the hospitals have closed have increased from 3.4 miles to 23.9 miles. 40% of rural hospitals that are remaining open are considered to be at immediate or high risk of closure. New York State, by the way, has 51 rural hospitals, two of which closed, I believe, in the past year um, or threatened to be closed. I think one closed and two are threatened. Uh, 12 are considered immediate risk for closure and 18 at high risk. In New York City, just to give you a magnitude of the scope of the problem, 19 hospitals closed between 2000 and 2013. New York State as a whole went from 3.3 beds per thousand down to 2.7 beds per thousand. The US average, by the way, is 2.8. And as we heard before, it's not equal even at the level of, of Queens compared to Manhattan. So Manhattan continues to retain 6.4 beds per thousand despite closures like St. Vincent's and the threatened closure at Beth Israel, the reduction in service at Beth Israel. But Queens has only 1.5 beds per thousand. And we saw the results of that with COVID. Uh, again, this is just a map, a uh, little older map from 1995 to 2012, showing where the hospitals closed compared to the percentage uh, overlaid on a map showing a uh, percentage of children living in poverty, not surprisingly, uh, which hospitals closed. Basically, Midtown East Side of Manhattan is sometimes referred to as Bedpan Alley, um, and those hospitals ain't closing. Um, again, overlaying where the hospitals are closing by poverty and by already medically underserved areas, according to federal statistics. And again, disproportionately, the hospitals are closing, A, in the outer boroughs, where less attention is paid by the power brokers, and also in poorer neighborhoods overall. The current financing model doesn't work, and this got further exposed during COVID. So here we have a situation with COVID where uh, there's a greater need for hospitals than ever. The hospital beds are all filled up. Um, the ICUs are uh, all filled up. Montefiore Hospital, um, which uh, we've heard about, was so overflowing taking care of people in the South Bronx that they were literally opening up their library and conference rooms and turning them into ICUs. So, the system was had more patients than ever before, and the hospitals were losing money like never before. Why? Because we our system is so screwed up that we reimburse so well for certain uh, so-called elective procedures. And elective doesn't mean it doesn't have to be done. It just means that when it's done, uh, that there's some, some choice. So all of the elective procedures were canceled. The hospitals were more filled with patients forever than ever, but because the reimbursement rates weren't as good for those things, uh, the hospitals were losing uh, literally billions and billions of dollars nationwide. Sorry. Um, so what about this claim about the hospitals going belly up? Well, we've already debunked it in part, but it turns out that three analyses shown here all by single payer skeptic groups, the Mercatus fu funded by the Koch brothers on the far right, the Rand Corporation on the center right, and the Urban Institute on the center uh, left, although with a um, animus towards single payer for reasons that I'm not entirely sure of. Nevertheless, all three of them agree that if we went to single payer, the total payments to America's hospitals would actually go up. So it's a little hard to understand how they're gonna go bankrupt. It's just nonsense. Single payer, in fact, calls for global budgeting for hospitals and we've seen, which makes the entire reimbursement rate argument moot. Um, and we've seen um, exactly why we need to have global budgeting. There is no reason for individual patient care services to be tied to the budget, nor vice versa. There is no reason that hospital budgets should be tied to individual case service reimbursement. And as we saw with COVID, uh, with hospitals being busier forever, but canceling high uh, profitable um, elective procedures, exactly where that goes wrong. In reality, all of the objections um, to single payer from the hospital side, or at least from their lobbyists and um, boards of directors, um, who I think have something to do with what their CEOs are allowed to say, um, all of them um, are in a sense, um, shall we call it Trumpian levels of projection. 
It is under the current hospital system, uh, system, under the current system of how we pay for hospitals that serving the underserved are closing and that maybe there's an oversupply concentrated in wealthy areas. There was a whole thing during the ACA about overtreatment, um, um, again, arguable, but it's under the current system where hospitals are dependent on elective case billing profitability that they're closing. It's the perverse finances of the current system uh, that when we're threatened with a surge need like the pandemic and care isn't profitable, that the hospitals uh, suddenly are in even greater trouble. It is under the current system uh, where hospitals that are not, the hospitals get located not on where they're needed. Um, it's under the current system where insurers interfere with medical decision via the prior authorization requirements that we've been seeing and the denial stuff that we were seeing. And it's under the current system that we have all those wasteful administrative billing systems. So uh, to summarize, again, red, white, and blue, um, all patients have good coverage, no patient is uninsured. Good for hospitals. Hospitals don't have to chase the patients for payment anymore. No more bad debt, no more charity care. Um, the language in single payer bills, including the New York Health Act, calls for no reduction on hospital uh, spending for care for patient services. All payments to hospitals uh, that are reasonable and reasonably related to cost efficiently paying for health services. No interference in Medicare decisions or prior authorizations. Um, and as I said before, the reduced costs um, as well. So I want to go for a moment and actually show you the ad that came for Greater New York Hospital Association. Um, it's really quite incredible in that, um, well, these are folks that ostensibly don't uh, do not support single payer. During this pandemic, doctors and hospitals have been on the saving lives. We trust their expertise, but insurance companies think they know better. They don't deliver care, but they do withhold hospital payments while questioning clinical decisions. The practice is called deny, delay, reduce, the opposite of how Medicare pays hospitals. That's right, Medicare. Insurance company profits have soared during COVID as our hospitals struggle. Tell Albany, protect hospitals, not insurance companies. So I would suggest that that ad could have been written by a single payer supporter. It could have been written by many of us on this panel. It's written by Greater New York Hospital Association addressing a specific uh, issue uh, that Larry raised, um, but even they agree. Fee-for-service Medicare is the best payer for hospitals currently. And with that, I'm gonna end. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, I want us 